Hey folks, and in today's instalment, we're going to be looking at the details of four cold cases that have got law enforcement agencies around the world completely baffled. From stolen, mur uh, from, from stolen airliners to dastardly murders and a mountaineering accident that is just totally creepy to say the least. But before we start, if you'd like it would be awesome to subscribe to this channel, a new venture that recounts details of crimes, cold cases, paranormal activities and unexplained events in story form. I'd appreciate a slap on that like button for this video if, it, if you so desire and a click on the notifications bell so that you'll be updated as and when new stories are submitted. Until then, let's take a look at the strange happenings on the flip side. It was the height of the Cold War, and on a windswept and snowbound Norwegian landscape on November 29, 1970, the charred remains of a woman was found. Located close to the village of Isdalen in Bergen, the unidentified woman became known as the Isdal woman. An autopsy indicated she had ingested sleeping pills before she died, inhaled carbon monoxide and had been burned alive. Later, a suitcase belonging to the woman was found containing money from multiple countries. Eventually, it was discovered that she was travelling around Europe with a number of forged passports containing different aliases. So what do we know about the Isdal woman? Now, the woman's burned body was discovered by a family hiking in the Isdal Valley near the city of Bergen in western Norway. She was found laid out flat on her back, badly burned along her front side, with the hands raised from her chest in an almost defensive posture. Scattered around the body were personal effects including a watch, an umbrella, some jewellery and several empty bottles. According to the BBC, police thought the objects had been arranged around the body in a peculiar way, almost suggesting a ritual had taken place. Now, one puzzling aspect about the clothes she was wearing, why they were all made of synthetic material, all of them had had their labels removed. It was initially thought she was aged somewhere in her thirties. An autopsy revealed she had ingested between 50 and 70 tablets of phenobarbital, a strong sedative barbiturate, and she also had significant bruising around her neck. She had also inhaled carbon monoxide and soot from being engulfed in flames, a clear indication that she had in fact been burned alive. With no identifying documents and the presence of large amounts of sleeping pills in her system, Norwegian officials were quite happy to rule her death a suicide. Now, a few days later, a pair of suitcases were found at a train station in Bergen with fingerprints that matched the dead woman. Inside, there were an assortment of wigs, makeup, clothing, eczema cream, eyeglasses, and non prescription lenses, maps, a small amount of money from Norway, the UK, Switzerland, and Belgium. But inside the lining of the case, there were a whole plethora of Deutschmarks in denominations of 100 Deutschmark bills, uh, which were the equivalent of about a thousand US dollars today. Now, after careful examination of the suitcase contents, it was found that identifying information had been detached, cut out or rubbed off. Even the eczema cream, which would normally have the name of the prescription doctor, was missing its label. Detectives did, however, find a shopping bag inside the suitcase and used it to trace the woman's whereabouts prior to her death. She had visited Norway several times during the year, staying at different hotels under fake names using forged passports. A 2017 BBC investigation found at one hotel she claimed to be Claudia Tilt from Brussels. At another, she was Elizabeth Leowulf from Ostend. Ultimately, people who interacted with her were located and interviewed. They all described a, a striking, stylish woman with dark hair and brown eyes, who was elegant, charming, and always paid in cash. She also spoke multiple languages, including French, Flemish, and English. She wore wigs and often seemed to be on edge. Now, years later, the Norwegian National Defence released records that indicated the woman may have been traversing the country observing the testing of the then top secret anti ship Penguin missile. A fisherman may have also spotted the woman watching Norwegian army troop movements. Does the spy narrative make sense? Norway, 
in the early 1970s was a flashpoint during the Cold War. Not only did it share a border with the Soviet Union, but it also played a substantial role in helping the United States and Britain monitor Russian nuclear testing and submarine warfare. It was known that Russian intelligence assets were active in the country, as were elements from the CIA, MI6 and Mossad. In 1973, Mossad agents assassinated a Moroccan waiter in Lillehammer, who they mistakenly thought to be one of the masterminds of the Munich Olympics massacre. So where's the case today? In 2005, a man from Bergen came forward after seeing a sketch of the Isdal woman. Five days before the woman's body was found in 1970, he reported seeing a person matching her description hiking on a hillside about an hour away from Isdal. She was underdressed for the weather and was being followed by two men who he said looked southern. He reported what he saw to the police who dismissed his statement. Now, before the Isdal woman was buried, a portion of her lower jaw was removed and saved. Her teeth showed signs of intricate dental work, which was unusual in Norway at the time. In 2017, a stable isotope analysis performed on her teeth suggested she was born in Nuremberg around 1930, but grew up near the border between France and Germany. The investigation of her dental work showed that it had been performed in either Central Asia, East Asia, southern Europe or somewhere in South America. Now the case still sparks great interest and in 2018 a podcast called Death in Ice Valley was produced by the BBC World Service in conjunction with the Norwegian Broadcasting Corporation. It was a documentary that explored the Isdal woman's death in minute detail. Whilst the stable isotope analysis did answer some questions, such as the woman's age, the country in which she was born, there remained many questions that it didn't. Was she a spy? If so, who killed her and why? Who was she working for? And perhaps most importantly, why haven't any of her friends, family members or loved ones ever come forward or reported her missing? The case continues. On May 25, 2003, two men, an American pilot and an aviation mechanic from the Republic of Congo, boarded a 727-223 jet that was parked at the Cuatro de Febrero Airport Luanda, Angola, and without permission from the air traffic control, they taxied the aircraft to the runway and took off. They then flew south over the Atlantic Ocean. Now, no trace of the men or the aircraft has ever, has ever been found. The motive for the theft remains unknown. The 727-223 had been illegally parked at the Cuatro de Febrero airport for over a year and had accrued the equivalent of four million US dollars in fines. Once a passenger jet for the American Airlines, it had been sold to a Miami-based aircraft agency who then had had it converted in order to transport diesel fuel to diamond mines throughout Africa. Most of the aircraft's interior had been stripped uh, to accommodate 10 500-gallon fuel tanks. It was in the process of being reconverted for use by a Nigerian carrier when it was stolen. The 727 was silver, had no identifying markings aside from a red, white and blue stripe along its length and the serial number N844AA emblazoned on its tail. Despite sitting on the tarmac at the airport for so long, the plane was thought to be in good mechanical shape. Now, even though the aircraft was structurally sound, it still needed some basic maintenance in order to make it fly. That's where American pilot and flight engineer Ben Padilla and Congolese mechanic John Mutantu come in. The two men were hired to help an Angolan maintenance team to get the 727 flight ready. They had been working on the aircraft for a few weeks when at around 5 p.m. on May 25, 2003, they boarded the plane, revved the engines and took off with over 9,000 pounds of fuel on board which would have given the plane a range of around 1,300 nautical miles. According to the FBI, Padilla, who was a licensed pilot but not trained to fly a 727, was believed to be at the controls. Also to further complicate things, a 727-223 normally requires three crew members to operate it correctly. The plane's last known heading was in a southwestern direction towards the Seychelles Islands, according to the Charlie Project, a non-profit group dedicated to cold cases. Now, whilst not much is known about the Congolese mechanic uh, Mutantu, 
there is a large number of interviews and testimony about Padilla. Family members describe him as having been interested in mechanics and aeronautics from an early age. According to Air and Space magazine, Padilla's co-workers stated that he was well versed in aviation and really knew his way around an aircraft. He also enjoyed working in far-flung locations from Southeast Asia to South America and all throughout Africa. One former employer, however, described him as only being ch interested in chasing local women and reported that he had also once skipped out on paying a $10,000 bill after staying at a luxury hotel in Indonesia. The theft occurred less than two years after the infamous events of 9-11, spurring law enforcement and intelligence agencies to frantically search the world for the plane. The prevailing notion was that an aircraft outfitted to carry thousands of pounds of extra fuel would make an especially potent suicide weapon. Intensive hunts were initially performed by the CIA and FBI in places like Sri Lanka, Nigeria, until suddenly in 2005 they stopped without any explanation. Despite numerous requests over the years from journalists and amateur investigators, both government agencies have largely declined to comment about the case. Now the reasons for the aircraft theft remain murky. In an interview with Air and Space magazine, Padilla's family believes he was either scammed or forced against his will to steal the plane. Now in 2009, a scorched and gutted 727 was found in Mali, Africa. It had been loaded with the cocaine, flown across the Atlantic Ocean from South America, deliberately ditched in a remote part of the desert and set ablaze. Although it was not the same plane stolen from Angola, some believe the 727 could have suffered a similar fate. As for Badia and Matantu, no evidence of either men's whereabouts has ever surfaced. They, the airplane and all possible permutations as to the facts of this event remain a complete mystery. Between February 1st and February 2nd in 1959, nine Russian hikers died on a remote section of the Ural Mountains under extremely mysterious conditions. Despite repeated attempts at explanations over the years, questions about what actually happened still endure. Now the hikers were all experienced in outdoor pursuits. They were all in their 20s and 30s in great shape and friends from the nearby Ural Polytechnic Institute. Led by Igor Alexeyevich Dyatlov, for whom the area is now named, they journeyed into a remote, remote section of the Ural Mountains and set up camp at the foot of a mountain that the indigenous Mansai people called Kolat Siakl. Now sometime in the middle of the night something occurred that made the group rip open their tent from within and flee into, the, into a blinding snowstorm with extremely low temperatures between minus 13 to minus 22 Fahrenheit. Now, given they had all exited from a state of sleep from within their sleeping bags, they were all severely underdressed, some only in long underwear, many were not even wearing shoes. They stumbled their way to a nearby tree line where they attempted to climb a tree and build a fire. Of the nine total members, six of them died from hypothermia, while three others died from extreme physical trauma. Of the hikers that died of trauma, one had a fractured skull, Another had chest fractures consistent with a violent car crash, while a third died from internal bleeding, brought on by the chest trauma. There were no puncture wounds on any of the victims, nor was there any damage to the soft tissue. Tracks in the snow and the lack of physical wounds on the bodies indicated that the deaths were not due to an attack by the Mansai people. Now, even weirder, two of the victims were missing their eyes, while another was missing his tongue. The clothing found on, on two victims was extremely radioactive and several of the victims were found to be wrapped in clothing that belonged to other climbers. Now, at the memorial service, friends and family reported that the bodies had white hair and orange coloured skin. Several years later, another group of hikers who were at the same time 30 miles south from Dyatlov's group reported seeing glowing orange orbs in the northern sky the evening of February 1st, according to Lev Ivanov, the lead investigator of the incident in 1959. Now, the initial Soviet investigation did not help dispel wild conjecture onto the case. Unable to come up with any kind of satisfactory conclusion, officials stated that the group had died to a compelling natural force. Some of the macabre aspects of the case can be explained rationally. 
The victims who were missing their eyes and tongue most likely came about due to the scavenging by wild animals. The orange coloured skin and white hair probably caused by exposure to the elements. Hikers wearing each other's clothing? Well, if some members of the group succumbed to hypothermia first, others would have possibly stripped the bodies for extra warmth. Makes sense. Over the years, there have been numerous attempts to explain the, the fate of Dyatlov's group. Conjecture has ranged from natural, natural phenomena such as avalanches and denser air currents that are drawn downwards by the force of gravity known as catabatic winds. Some people have suggested military involvement such as having succumbed to tests of parachute mines and infrasound weapons. Others have also posed the potential of alien, UFO and cryptic attack. Then there are accounts from people who are closely tied to the case that the fueled speculation in supernatural causes and conspiracy theories. In 1990, the former head of the Communist Party of the town near Dyatlov Pass wrote that there had been supposed UFO sightings in the area during the time of the deaths. Recently, when interviewed for an article for The Atlantic, Yuri Kuntsevich, who was a boy attending the funeral for the hikers, stated that the group had been coerced by a Western intelligence agent to take photographs of, of a nearby Soviet missile test and then murdered. Now, in 2019, Russian investigators reopened the case and came to the conclusion that the hikers were caught in an avalanche, tore open their tent to escape and made their way to the nearby tree line. Finding themselves inadequate, inadequately dressed in, freezing, in a freezing snowstorm, they attempted to, to make a fire and climb a tree to spot their campsite. Several of the party died of hypothermia, while the others attempted to construct a crude makeshift shelter from tree branches, snow and rocks. The shelter collapsed in the violent weather, leading to the catastrophic injuries suffered by the other three hikers. The bodies were then scavenged by wild animals. This is where the case is at the moment. Still cold, no definitive answers. On June 30th, 1999, the body of 41-year-old Ricky McCormick was found in a cornfield in West Alton, Missouri. In McCormick's front pocket were two pages of printed notes containing a complex cipher that the FBI, the American Cryptogram Association and countless amateur codebreakers have, to date, failed to crack. McCormick was a high school dropout who, according to family members, couldn't write anything. He couldn't write a code. He couldn't spell anything. He could just scribble. In fact, he was illiterate. McCormick's body had been decomposing in the field for several days prior to its discovery. Authorities had to use fingerprints to make a positive identification. The rate of decomposition made it difficult for medical examiners to determine a cause of death, even after an autopsy and toxicology report. But after considering the suspicious nature of where his body had been found, because the area had in the past been used to dump murder victims, investigators classified the death a homicide. Now, the two notes police found inside McCormick's pocket consisted of 30 lines of seemingly random letters and numbers. Some of the code contained parentheses or brackets and other parts of it were circled. McCormick was an ex-con who held down a part-time employment at a gas station and alternated between staying with family friends and living on the streets. He also suffered from heart and lung ailments and had been collecting disability at the time of his death. His criminal record consisted of a handful of misdemeanors, plus a stint in prison for statutory rape. McCormick's body was found some 15 miles from his residence, even though he did not own a car, and public transportation in the area where he was found didn't service that area. McCormick also sporadically traveled by bus to Florida, where a former girlfriend confirmed that he acted as a courier for drug smugglers, shuttling marijuana back towards Missouri. Now, the investigation shows there are conflicting reports about McCormick's mental condition. According to a Riverfront Times article, while awaiting trial for statutory rape, his public defender believed McCormick might be suffering from some form of mental disease or defect. She'd had him tested by a local psychologist who found McCormick mentally competent to stand trial. 
Though he was never diagnosed with any specific mental disorder, McCormick was considered to be street smart with an active imagination, yet also possessed a naive, childlike attitude towards the world, according to this editorial. Now, a few days before his death, McCormick's girlfriend stated that he would return from a drug smuggling job in Florida, shaken and anxious. He went to several hospitals for treatment of chest pains and asthma in the days before his death. Now, some investigators believe he wasn't actually looking for medical attention, but believed his life was in jeopardy and was thus seeking a place, a safe place to stay. By 2011, the FBI's Cryptoanalysis and Racketeering Records Unit had exhausted its resources in trying to crack the cipher. Breaking the code could reveal the victim's whereabouts before his death and could lead to solutions of a homicide, the FBI said in a 2011 statement. Now, some people, including members of Ricky's family, believe the notes to be the nonsensical script of a mentally disabled person. Other family members claim that Ricky had been writing in code since he was a boy. Now, experts, including an FBI agent in charge of the case, think that the notes are authentic. Small details in the handwriting, like circles around portions of the code, indicated that it could have been personal in nature, possibly a to-do list. According to the FBI, the greatest challenge in this case is that McCormick likely intended the notes only to be read by himself, whereas other famous ciphers, like the Zodiac Killer, wanted their codes to eventually be cracked. There is, of course, the possibility that Cormac did not even write the code. Experts have suggested, because they've not been able to conclusively prove that the notes are his handwriting, that it's also feasible that the code was written for him by the drug dealers that he was working for at the time, or that he was just transporting a cipher from one place to another and being completely unaware of its meaning. The FBI has an entire website dedicated to the case and invites amateur codebreakers to try and solve it. Now, if you consider yourself to be somewhat of a sleuth and codebreaker, I've linked that site in the description below. Ultimately, it's believed that the code contains information that will help catch McCormick's murderers. So there you have it, four cold cases that have law enforcement agencies the world over completely baffled. If you have any idea as to what could have happened in any of these cases, feel free to post your thoughts below. Who knows, you could be the next Sherlock Holmes. And cheers once again for your support. Be sure to hit that subscribe button, slap a like on this video and drop, drop kick that notifications bell so that you'll be notified as and when there's new content from yours truly. So until the next time, folks, take care, be healthy, and I'll see you on the flip side.